John Edward Jones, a devout Christian and a very kind-hearted soul. If his family were to create a portrait for you of John's character, they would paint a picture of a solid man with good morals, a man with a great work ethic, one that loved people to no end, and one that made everybody in his life feel loved and appreciated. John's life was going good. His career sights were set, and he was studying to one day become a pediatric cardiologist. Not only were his professional ambitions on track for success, but his goals for building a family were coming true as well. Not long ago he became a father, and his wife was already on the way with their second child. When John wasn't at work or at home with his family, he'd be enjoying other areas of his life. One area was his love for caving. His father would often take him and his brother Josh out for caving adventures when they were children. They absolutely loved it, and the experiences left lasting impressions. It had been quite some time since the last time they'd gone, but John and Josh wanted to experience those same feelings again, so they decided they would begin planning for some more cave exploration. It was right before Thanksgiving and John had come from Virginia to spend some holiday time with his family down in Utah. So with all that considered, John and Josh decided that they would try exploring an area named Nutty Putty Cave while the opportunity still presented itself. Nutty Putty Cave is located in the middle of a desert in Utah not far from where he was visiting. The cave received the name Nutty Putty due to the soft brown clay found distributed throughout its tunnels. The cave was first explored in 1960, and it soon became known for its very narrow and claustrophobic passageways. The known length of the cave stretching up to 1,355 feet, and its depth reaching to 145 feet. It sounded exciting to them, and their plans were now in effect. Fast forward. It's now November 24th, 2009. It's 8pm on a Wednesday, and it's the day they arrive at the cave site. They reach the spot with nine other friends and family members as a way to bond during the holiday. For the first hour, the group explored the right side of the cave. Without having to go very far in, they could explore the largest section of the cave named the Big Slide. John, his brother, and two others that were in the party decided to leave the group for a challenge that had a promising reward. This challenge involved them crawling through an extremely small and narrow area called the Birth Canal. If they succeeded in getting through that difficult area, the cave would open up into a beautiful large room. The idea seemed promising. John would go first, crawling and wriggling through the small opening slowly. As he made his way, it seemed like things were taking longer than expected, but nothing seemed to miss so he just kept going. He traveled further through the small passageway, excitedly awaiting the big open part of the cave that he was crawling towards. He couldn't see it yet, but he couldn't wait to get through so he could experience it. He climbed up and over a section of rock until the cave began to angle downwards, climbing through expecting that the entrance to their destination must be soon. The angle of the passageway suddenly declined even sharper, assuming that it would open up soon he kept going. He had been climbing downwards for about roughly 20 feet now. He was positioned at an almost 90 degree angle in a passageway that he could barely fit into, in a position where he couldn't pull himself up and he couldn't turn around either. In a position where he had the realization that the passageway that he was climbing through all that time wasn't a passageway at all. The area he had mistakenly climbed through wasn't the birth canal like he had planned. The area was named Ed's Push, and unfortunately Ed's Push leads to four dead ends, and John was completely stuck in one of these dead ends, in a position where it was impossible for him to get back out by himself. John was 6 feet tall and 200 pounds. He wasn't a small guy, and he was stuck 400 feet into the cave, 100 feet below the surface, upside down in a crevice that measured 10 by 18 inches. A standard A4 piece of paper, which is the standard for most printers, measures at roughly 8 by 12 inches, 8.3 by 11.7 to be exact. So if you want to see the actual size of what he was stuck in, pick up a piece of paper and imagine adding 2 inches to the shorter side and 6 inches to the longer side. It's pretty small. John could barely move an inch. His brother Josh had been climbing behind him when it happened so he was the first to find John. One of John's hands was stuck beneath him and the other hand was forced upwards. Josh tried to pull him back up, but it proved to be too difficult. He could only move him a few inches before he began sliding back down. 
there was nothing any of them could do. So one of their friends stayed with John while his brother got out of the cave as quickly as possible to call for help. The first rescuer to arrive found John at around 12 a.m. the following morning. By now, he had been in this horrible upside down position for at least three hours. As the hours went by, more and more rescuers piled in to try to help. In total, there were 137 people doing everything that they could to get him out. But out of all of those people, only a few were small enough to be able to get down to where he was. It was so narrow and steep that at a later point, one of the rescuers temporarily got stuck themselves trying to free him. They tried coming up with many plans. Some of them involved climbing cams and ropes. Some even went as far as lubing the walls of the cave. The situation was getting desperate, and they were trying quickly to come up with anything and everything that might work. All of the plans were failing, and everybody was panicking but trying to stay calm. They finally landed on an idea involving a rope pulley system. They would drill bolts at key points throughout the tunnel where they would anchor the pulleys into the rock, and they would then tie the rope around his ankles so they could pull him back up. Meanwhile, drilling away at the rock around him to make more space. But at the rate that was progressing, it was practically doing nothing. Even with this newly revised plan, it seemed impossible. The ceiling of the roof was so low that when they pulled him up, his own feet would get in the way. And it was such a narrow and awkward opening that pulling him backwards risked bending him in a way that would have broken his legs. The time that he spent in that position was working against him every minute that he stayed down there. Fluid was pooling more and more in his head and in his lungs, and his heart was pumping desperately against gravity to keep the blood flowing properly through his brain and the rest of his body. At around the 19 hour mark, John was able to speak with his wife through a two-way radio that they brought down for them, and his wife was able to comfort him temporarily. The pulley system was finally built, and eight people began pulling him up, taking lots of breaks because of how much pain he was in during the process. Inch by inch, they pulled him up until the one that was closest to him could make eye contact. After all of those desperate, hard-working hours, they had finally made progress. When they had first gotten to him, they could only see his shoes protruding from the small opening. The fact that one of them could finally see his face was a miracle. He was stressed out, exhausted, and dirty, but he was one step closer to being free again. Before continuing, one of the rescuers asked him how he was doing. It sucks. I'm upside down. I can't believe I'm upside down. My legs are killing me. Even in the position John was faced with, John still had a smile on his face. After all of this, he somehow still managed to have high spirits. They took a small break again before pulling him up further. They continued. But when the team went to pull him up this time, they all went flying back. The one that was closest to John was knocked out briefly by a metal carabiner. The main bolt and pulley closest to John had come free. The rock that it was fixed to had completely shattered from the force of them pulling, and John had unfortunately fallen all the way back into the hole. This accident undoing every bit of progress that was made throughout the past 19 hours, and this time he was farther down the crevice than he was when they originally found him. The one that had been struck was so injured that he had to back out of the cave to have someone else replace him. This injured rescuer's father was also a part of the efforts and went down to help. By the time he got down there, John's breathing sounded much more labored than before. At least when they could hear him breathing. It was obvious that time was running out quick. He tried to jam himself into the space where John was so he could wrap a rope around his waist, but failed and had to back out because he began to get stuck himself. After struggling for a while, he somehow got himself out. He crawled back up a bit, drilled a hole, and fixed another anchor for the pulley system, but had to back out as well because of how exhausted he was. John had now been down there for a very long time. A medical professional crawled into the cave because of how John was when they last heard his breathing, and from the stress that was put on his body from being upside down for the past 27 hours, on the 25th of November, just before 12 a.m., John was pronounced deceased from cardiac arrest. The following day, it was decided that it would be too dangerous to try to retrieve his body, and to this day, he is still resting in the same spot. A week after that, they used explosives to bring down the area around Jones's body, and they cemented the entire entryway to prevent anybody from meeting the same fate. 
His family had a plaque made to be placed at the entrance of the cave. 